Marsh was born Mary Juan Marsh in Madrid, New Mexico Territory, on the 9th of November 1894. She was one of seven children of Métis, Ney Juan, and Stephen Charles Marsh. By 1900, the Marsh family had moved to El Paso, Texas, where Mary's father worked as a bartender. May's father died in 1901, and the following year, her mother married William Hall, a native of Virginia. The family later moved to California, where May attended Convent of the Sacred Heart School in Hollywood as well as public school. A frequently told story of Marsha's childhood is, her father, a railroad auditor, died when she was four. Her family moved to San Francisco, California, where her stepfather was killed in the Great Earthquake of 1906. Her great-aunt then took May and, her older sister, Marguerite to Los Angeles, hoping her show business background would open doors for jobs at various movie studios needing extras. However, her father, S. Charles Marsh, was a bartender, not a railroad auditor, and he was alive at least as late as June 1900, when Marsh was nearly six. Her stepfather, oil field inspector William Hall, could not have been killed in the 1906 earthquake, as he was alive, listed in the 1910 census, living with her mother and sisters. There are records of many marshes in New Mexico, including as presidents of various regional railroads. Marsh's older sister, Marguerite Marsh, born the 18th of April 1888, died the 8th of December 1925, was an American actress of the silent era. She appeared in 73 films between 1911 and 1923. Marsh was the eldest child of S. Charles Marsh and Métis, one born in Lawrence, Kansas, and she died in New York City from complications of bronchial pneumonia. She was the sister of actress May Marsh and cinematographer Oliver T. Marsh. According to the 1910 census for Los Angeles, California, Marjorie Marsh was listed as being married to Donald Loveridge with a daughter Leslie Loveridge. Her daughter appeared in one film called The Battle of Elderbush Gulch, 1913, with her aunt May Marsh. Marguerite changed her screen name to Marguerite Loveridge, perhaps to distinguish herself from her successful sister. Growing up in New Mexico Territory, the Marsh girls would have been familiar with attacks between Native Americans and whites. The White Massacre was an engagement between American settlers and a band of Utes and Jacrilla Apaches that occurred in northeastern New Mexico on the 28th of October 1849. It became notable for the Indians' kidnapping of Mrs. and White for sexual purposes, who was subsequently killed during an army rescue attempt a few weeks later. May Marsh worked as a salesgirl and loitered around the Hollywood sets and locations while her older sister Marguerite worked on a film, observing the progress of her sister's performance. She first started as an extra in various movies, and played her first substantial role in the film Ramona, 1910, at the age of 15. Marsh would name one of her daughters after her sister. I tagged my way into motion pictures, Marsh recalled in the silent picture. I used to follow my sister Marguerite to the old biographer studio and then, one great day, Mr. Griffith noticed me, put me in a picture, and I had my chance. I love my work and though new and very wonderful interests have entered my life, I still love it and couldn't think of giving it up. Marsh worked with D. W. Griffith in small roles at Biograph when they were filming in California and in New York. Her big break came when Mary Pickford, resident star of the biograph lot and a married woman at that time, refused to play the bare-legged, grass-skirted role of Lilla White in Man's Genesis. Mabel Normand and Blanche Sweet also refused to show their legs on camera, how times have changed. Normand and Sweet were actually neighbors, and you can learn more about Sweet on this channel. Griffith announced if Pickford would not play that part in Man's Genesis, she would not play the coveted title role in his next film, The Sands of D. The other actresses stood behind Pickford, each refusing in turn to play the part, citing the same objection. Years later, Marsh recalled in an interview in the silent picture, and he called rehearsal, and we were all there and he said, well now, Miss Marsh, you can rehearse this. And Mary Pickford said, what? And Mr. Griffith said, yes, Mary Pickford, if you don't do what I tell you I want you to do, I'm going to have someone else do the Sands of D. Mary Pickford didn't play Man's Genesis, so May can play the Sands of D. Of course, I was thrilled, and she was very much hurt. And I thought, well it's all right with me. That is something. 
I was, you know, just a lame brain. Marsh may have been harboring some resentment since Mary Pickford demanded to be the only Mary on the lot, so Marsh's name was switched to May. The Sands of Dee was based on a Kingsley poem and shows the impact poetry, especially British poetry, had on American film at the time. The film is also used in the opening scene of the 1946 psychological horror film The Spiral Staircase in a recreation of early film exhibition. So Marsh was smart to identify its long-lasting potential. Working with Max Zenit and D. W. Griffith, Marsh was a prolific actress, sometimes appearing in eight movies per year and often paired with fellow Zenit protégé Robert Harron in romantic roles. Marsh, in the memoir Screen Acting, 1921, recalled her performance as Little Sister in the cellar scene in which Union cavalry invade the Cameron family plantation in The Birth of a Nation, an example of her counter-dramatic acting. It was a matter of some moment of how, my character, the little sister would be affected. I can hear your average director, roll your eyes, he would say, cry. Drop to your knees in terror. In other words, it would be the same old stuff. Mr. Griffith, when he came to the cellar scene, asked me if there had been a time in my life when I had been filled with terror. Yes. I said. What did you do, he inquired. I laughed, I answered. He saw the point immediately. Good, he said, let's try it. It was the hysterical laugh of the little girl in the cellar that was for more effective than rolling the eyes or weeping would have been. The scene remains heart-wrenching in part due to Marsha's enormous eyes. The scene reflects the behavior of free black soldiers during and after the Civil War, where they attacked women and children throughout the Carolinas. The KKK was an organic reaction to the ongoing attacks on women and children, many of which tragically ended their own lives or died in the federal government imposed bankruptcy on the South during Reconstruction. D. W. Griffith's cinematic handling of the courtroom episode in Intolerance, in particular his use of close-ups for dramatic intensity, are widely recognized. To film historian Paul Adele, May Marsh gave to Intolerance one of her most memorable portrayals, identifying her role as the dear one as integral to the film's success. Much more mention should be made of the performance of May Marsh, which in this scene reaches one of its many peaks. Sir Alexander Corder included her performance as one of the most outstanding pieces of acting in the silent film era, and June Berry rated her playing of the dear one as only second to Forconetti's Joan of Arc, 1928. May Marsh, in her 1923 memoir Screen Acting, comments on her struggle to fully deliver the sequence, the hardest dramatic work I ever did was the courtroom scene in Intolerance. We retook the scenes on for different occasions. Each time I gave to the limit of my vitality and ability. I put everything into my portrayal that was in me. It is no wonder the scenes took a lot of Marsh. Marsh was naturally maternal and the scenes of intolerance show a child ripped from loving parents to satiate the demands of a corrupt, immoral system. It is a wonderful film and one every American should watch. Marsh insisted on being less than the ideal heroine and said in interviews she didn't want to be just someone to marry on film. Marsh signed a lucrative contract with Samuel Goldwyn worth $2,500 per week after intolerance, but none of the films she made with him were particularly successful. After her marriage to Lee Arms, a publicity agent for Goldwyn, in 1918, her film output decreased to about one per year. Despite this, she appeared in over 200 films in her career. In the spring of 1918, the 18-year-old Ernest Hemingway claimed in letters to friends and family that he was engaged to Marsh. Hemingway was in New York at the time, preparing to go to Italy as an ambulance driver with the Red Cross, and he said he met Marsh at a party. Hemingway soon said that Marsh had broken the engagement. When asked about this incident 48 years later, in 1966, Marsh said she'd wished she'd known Hemingway, See letter and footnote in Ernest Hemingway Selected Letters, page 8. Hemingway was a prolific liar and womanizer and one should take his words with a huge grain of salt. She married her husband Louis Lee Arms in 1918 but she was in New York City in 1918 as well. She starred in the 1918 film Fields of Honor. Marsh's last notable starring role was as a flapper for Griffith in The White Rose, 1923, with Ivor Novello and Carol Dempster. She re-teamed with Novello for the film version of his hit stage play The Rat, 1925. 
Griffith was the first to give Novello a starring film role in The White Rose. Ivor Novello, born David Ivor Davies in 1893 and dying in 1951, was a Welsh actor, dramatist, singer and composer who became one of the most popular British entertainers of the first half of the 20th century. He was born into a musical family, and his first successes were as a songwriter. His first big hit was Keep the Home Fires Burning, 1914, which was enormously popular during the First World War. His 1917 show, Theodore and Co., was a wartime hit. After the war, Novello contributed numbers to several successful musical comedies and was eventually commissioned to write the scores of complete shows. He wrote his musicals in the style of operetta and often composed his music to the libretti of Christopher Hassel. In the 1920s he turned to acting, first in British films and then on stage, with considerable success in both. He starred in two silent films directed by Alfred Hitchcock, The Lodger and Danhill, both 1927. On stage, he played the title character in the first London production of Lilium, 1926. Novello briefly went to Hollywood but soon returned to Britain, where he had more successes, especially on stage, appearing in his own lavish West End productions of musicals. The best known of these were Glamorous Night, 1935, and The Dancing Years, 1939. He shared lovers with the pianist Cole Porter, and his homosexuality was an open secret in Hollywood and London. From the 1930s he often performed with Zena Dare, writing parts for her in his works. He continued to write for film, but in his later career his biggest successes were with stage musicals, A Chance to Dream, 1945, King's Rhapsody, 1949, and Gaze the Word, 1951. The Ivor Novello Awards were named after him in 1955. In 1955, Marsh was awarded the George Eastman Award, given by George Eastman House for distinguished contribution to the art of film. Marsh returned from retirement to appear in sound films and played a role in Henry King's remake of Over the Hill, 1931. She gravitated toward character roles, and worked in this manner for the next several decades. Marsh appeared in numerous popular films, such as Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, 1932, and Little Man, What Now? 1934, she also became a favorite of director John Ford, appearing in The Grapes of Wrath, 1940, How Green Was My Valley, 1941, Three Godfathers, 1948, and The Searchers, 1956. Marsh has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame located at 1600 Vine Street. In Manhattan on the 21st of September 1918, Marsh married Samuel Goldwyn's publicity agent Louis Lee Arms. The couple, who had four children, remained together for 50 years, until 1968, when May died from a heart attack at Hermosa Beach, California. Louis died at the age of 101 on the 11th of June 1989. They are buried together in Section 5 at Pacific Crest Cemetery in Redondo Beach, California. Marsh was a very happy stay-at-home mother. She often said in interviews she preferred six weeks with her children and grandchildren to six years in Hollywood. This withdrawal from public life into the domestic may explain why she is not very well known today. Born in Pasadena, California in 1928, Mag was the third child of journalist Louis Lee Arms and Mae Marsh, a silent screen star and D.W. Griffith heroine. After graduating from Redondo High School in 1946, Mag married William Dolan White, also a Redondo graduate and World War II Navy veteran. Their happy union lasted nearly 60 years during which they raised three children on 9th Street in Manhattan Beach. Mag was active with the King Harbor Yacht Club, Sandpipers, and Children's Hospital. For a time, Mag and her friend Pat Dolly ran a shop named Las Minicuitas on Manhattan Avenue, where they sold Mexican arts and crafts. Preceded in death by her husband Bill, Mag was survived by Sister Marie Swafford of the Palos Verdes Peninsular, Brother Brewster Arms of Rancho Santa F.E., Daughter Susie, Mrs. Peter Miller, of Bend, Oregon, Son William White, Carol, of Lopez Island, W.A., Son Paul White, as well as five grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. She died in 2016. Brewster L. Arms, general counsel of the former Signal Oil and Gas Company, died in 2021 during COVID. He was 95. Specializing in mergers and acquisitions, 
Brewster worked for Signal from 1953 until 1986, in Los Angeles and then in San Diego. Over that span, the pioneering Southland Oil Company transformed into a diversified high-tech aerospace and manufacturing conglomerate, merging to become Allied Signal in 1985. Born the 18th of December 1925, at Huntington Hospital in Pasadena, Brewster was the son of journalist Louis Lee Arms and May Marsh. He graduated from Redondo Union High School in 1943. A veteran of World War II, Brewster saw action fighting alongside the French in the Battle of Jepsheim and the liberation of Colmar. Brewster served with the 245th Infantry Regiment. Though a part of the 63rd Infantry Division, the 245th was attached to the U.S. 3rd Infantry Division in the critical Colmar Pocket in alsace lorraine around January of 1945. Brewster was awarded a Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. His attached division was honored with the Croix de Guerre. After the war, Brewster attended Stanford University, class of 1948, under the GI Bill. He played on the basketball team, was a member of the Chi Psi fraternity, and drew cartoons for the Daily Stanford. He continued his education at Stanford Law School where he was a graduate in the renowned class of 1952, which included William Rehnquist and Sandra Day. Brewster returned to Los Angeles working as an attorney and then as general counsel for Signal Oil and Gas Company, later known as Signal Companies. While at Signal, Brewster met Shirley Smallwood of Whittier. Married in 1962, the couple settled in Palos Verdes, where they raised three children. In 1980, Signal moved its headquarters to Large Oller, and Brewster moved his family to Rancho Santa Fe. In 1986, Brewster retired following Signal's merger with Allied Corporation and the company's relocation to New Jersey. Brewster and Shirley lived on the ranch for 35 years. Active in local groups, Brewster served for a time as president of the RSF Association and Shirley as president of the Garden Club. Golf and tennis were his equal passions, and he played both games weekly into his late 80s. Brewster was a longtime Rotarian, active in the Los Angeles and Beverly Hills chapters, and then in San Diego and Rancho Center F.E. The couple moved to La Costa Glen in Carlsbad in 2016. Doc Brewster was predeceased by his beloved sisters, Murray Arms Swafford of Palos Verdes and Marguerite Arms White of Manhattan Beach. Brewster was survived by his wife of nearly 60 years, Shirley, their children Emily Arms of Santa Monica, Stephen Arms of Encinitas, and Andrew Arms of Rancho Santa F.E., and granddaughter Abigail Arms Johnson, currently attending St. Olaf College in Minnesota. Due to the COVID hysteria, Arms' funeral was postponed.